Welcome back, boils and ghouls. Remember, if you enjoy these videos, please like, share, comment, and hog smash that subscribe button. But now, it is trivia time. Sam Keith is one of my all-time favorite artists and a pivotal character in the journey to overcoming my learning disabilities, which actually prevented me from learning to read until I was about eight years old, which I've talked about before. While I love a lot of his work, I'm not going to lie, the Max is his high watermark for me. The Max is at once completely dated and of its time, and on the other hand, almost timeless in its bizarre Alice in Wonderland-esque tone and borderline farcical fantasy world. The Max could never have happened in another period in comics, and it's only by a miracle of chances and luck, according to Sam Keith, that it happened at all. Despite this, The Max spawned an animated adaptation by MTV, an audio drama adaptation, and a cult following of fans that have fervently followed Sam Keith for more than 20 years through several retirements from the industry and his apparent and complete distaste for anything having to do with the Max at this point. Sam Keith, one of the most self-deprecating, defacing, and insecure professional artists that I have ever heard of, walked away from the industry for a full two years following the Max's conclusion, despite the title being well-received and selling decently for the majority of its 35-issue run without so much as a word. Even the Max's final issue leaves a lot of questions. In one response to a letter, he talks about what's going to be happening next in the series, and yet in a separate column preceding the letters page, he announces that the Max is ending with that issue. What was the story? Was the book canceled because of bad sales having to do with the implosion of the speculators market going on in the comic book industry at that point, as Sam Keith has alluded to for so many years? Was Sam Keith simply tired of the workload? He had been a prodigious workhorse in the industry for years. Maybe the pressure had finally just gotten to him. I was always very interested to know just why Sam Keith disappeared from the industry overnight. He was one of the second wave of Image Comics alumni, directly recruited personally by none other than Jim Lee himself, and he enjoyed almost complete autonomy during his tenure at Image. I thought that maybe Image began pushing for more Max material that Sam Keith didn't really feel like producing, and perhaps there was bad blood with Marvel and DC because of his departure for Image. There had to be some reason, but the tight-lipped artist wasn't going to be giving up his secrets easily. Drawing from a minute amount of interviews spread across nearly three decades at this point, chasing letters, columns, self-published blog posts, and even solicitations and preview quotes to piece together just what happened to Sam Keith, this has been one of the most challenging and personally rewarding videos I've had the pleasure of putting together yet. The answer to what happened would be superstar artist Sam Keith is far more complex than I would have ever imagined, and I've spent the better part of the last year getting to the bottom of this story and putting all the pieces together. From strange beginnings and nearly a decade of underground and independent work, Sam Keith fought his way up from the bottom only to leave it all behind without ever looking back. To understand why a general overview of the man and his career is kind of required. So this is going to be my first two-part video. Tonight, we'll discuss how Sam Keith walked away from the comic book industry without so much as a whisper and why. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Sandman and Sam Keith, the beginning of the end. what I would call an interesting, if eclectic, artist to say the least. He's always been hypercritical of his own work, often quick to put it down, genuinely questioning why people are even interested in it. I honestly think that he believes that he's fooling people with his work somehow, tricking them into believing that he's talented when in reality he's anything but. It took Keith an excruciating 10 years to break into the industry, but his struggles unfortunately would not end there. I personally tend to believe that Sam Keith has it all wrong. I can critically assess the shortcomings of his work, and in doing so, it quickly becomes evident that they're far outweighed by the passionate originality which disposes with the needs of traditional form and composition, 
On such a successful level, I can only compare it to Bill Sienkiewicz in the mainstream art form of comic books. Few other people have ever been able to cast off the general expectations when looking at the human form as profoundly and beautifully as Sam Keith. Admittedly, when he started his work, it was almost equal parts Frank Frazetta and Bernie Wrightson, but Keith eventually became his own man and refined his form, ironically with the help of the Max in particular, to an exact science. Sam Keith spent nearly five years on the Max, generating 24 pages of some of the most insanely detailed work in the industry on a monthly basis almost never getting behind schedule, refusing to fall victim to what seemed the infectious disease of chronic tardiness that most of the other Image Comics artists suffered from. The Max might not have fallen too far behind in publishing, but the stories got weird. Like the second season of Twin Peaks weird. The last 10 issues of the Max are filled with unresolved plots, bizarre unconnected and disjointed stories, and plenty of other patented Sam Keith strangeness. The first 20 issues are absolutely enthralling. Teamed with co-writer William Messner Loeb's until issue 24, the partnership was able to distill Keith's characters and art into a cohesive and interwoven story of immense proportions. After Loeb's departure though, the Max radically shifts directions and undergoes a distinct tonal shift. Over the preceding 11 issues, the art also noticeably undergoes an intense shift in style and quality. The Max was never really wrapped up in a traditional sense. There is an ending of sorts, but Sam Keith has always said that people wanted him to cancel the Max because it had basically become a betrayal of its namesake. He's also historically noted low sales figures having to do with a comic book implosion happening at that point and a general disinterest in fans for the title's unceremonious cancellation. After months of research, I no longer believe this to be the case. I don't think the image canceled the Max. I don't think that people were disinterested with the Max. I don't think that it was selling that poorly. I think that Sam Keith was done with the Max. He basically thought that he was done with the industry altogether. In fact, even if he never came right out and said it at the time, this was probably because he wasn't saying much of anything to anyone in the industry for the next two years. He did eventually return, but his titles were from then on plagued by lateness. How did a man who was virtually never behind schedule, a meticulous planner who was able to produce a monthly title of the quality that most of the other image creators could only dream of, become such a reclusive, self-loathing artist that he can hardly even ink an agreement on a title before they announce a delay in its publication. Interestingly enough, a year into my research, I think that the answer to both of these questions is actually the same thing. The Max. Getting there, though, is a long road. So tonight we're going to start with Sam Key's days in the independent industry and work our way through his time on Sandman and Marvel Comics Presents in a little tale that I'm calling Preludes and Nocturnes. Or Sandman and Sam Keith. I know, I'm super original, right? Flashback to the chaotic comic book industry of the 1980s. In 1983, the mainstream comic book market was undergoing a massive shift. Sales fluctuated, and while empires were built overnight, they seemed to crumble just as quickly. The burgeoning success of black and white underground and independent comic book markets of the time offered an opening for many young artists that were looking to work in the field, albeit for less than optimal pay, just to get their work published and out there, and Sam Keith was no exception. While he would be skyrocketed into the public eye with his groundbreaking cover work on Marvel Comics Presents in 1991, perceived at the time as an overnight success, this was likely because people had just never heard of the books he was working on for the last nine years. Keith had made his bones in the industry primarily as an anchor, working for Comico, who I've talked about before and will continue to talk about because they published some amazing stuff. Comico put out Sam Keith's first professional work, the 10-page black and white Max the Hair, published in the 1983 Comico Primer number 5. His relationship with Comico continued with a successful stint, inking his first quote-unquote 
color work for Matt Wagner on Mage the Hero Discovered, starting with issue 6 in 1985. In at least two interviews with Sam Keith that I was able to find, he alluded to the fact that he had done professional black and white work preceding this work in the Mage color book with Matt Wagner. He inked at least two pages for a series called Spaced in 1985, and while it's logical to conclude Keith may have been referring to this and the Comico Primer story, the way he talked about inking in reference to this work makes me believe he also did some inking around this time that he never took credit for and has never taken credit for to this day in 2020. Regardless of whether this work exists, Keith spent a little over a year and a half on Mage inking issue 6 through the series conclusion with issue 15. Probably as equally important in regards to the actual work on Mage was how Sam Keith got the job. In a rare interview with longtime friend and partner in crime William Mesner Lobes, Mesner Lobes revealed just how Sam Keith had actually gotten hired in the first place. Keith and Mesner Loeb's had first met at the 1983 San Diego Comic Con. Mesner Loeb's was in line waiting to meet Harvey Kurtzman and had brought a copy of his book, Journey the Adventures of Wolverine McAllister. Sam Keith happened to be standing in front of him in line. When they were told that the line was too long and that they wouldn't be able to meet Kurtzman, the two were getting along well enough that it wasn't a big deal. They went across the street to get a coat together and they begin commiserating about the industry with each other. The details of this conversation are unfortunately lost to time. I do know that while they sat having a drink, presumably William Mesner Loeb's showed him a copy of Journal and Sam Keith complained about how he would never break into the industry. Sam Keith apparently wandered off in the middle of a conversation with little warning and Mesner Loeb's kind of just forgot about it. Journey was being published by Aardvark Vanheim, Dave Sims in print responsible for putting out Cerebus and a few other titles by this point. Six months later in 1983, Sim held PetuniaCon, a celebration of all things Cerebus and independent in the comic book world, and Sam Keith was there. He tracked down William Mesner Lobes and showed him some samples of the work that he'd done. Apparently, Sam Keith had spent the last six months practicing his inking on William Mesner Loeb's work. If you look at Journey, the art has a very whimsical illustrative style, a flowing cartoonish line, a line he shared in common with Wrightson and Frazetta, one that Keith was already obsessed with. I think William Mesner Loeb's art played an exceptionally large part in the evolution of Sam Keith's art, especially his early work on Mage. Mesner Loeb's was also working at Comico by this point, though I was unable to track down any details on what he might have been working on. Regardless, Mesner Loeb suggested to Comico that they should hire Sam Keith for Mage when he heard that they were looking for an anchor after issue 5 and got Sam Keith his first real work in the industry. The relationship would bounce back and forth over the next decade or so, with Mesner Loeb's getting Keith work and then Keith getting Mesner Loeb's work, culminating with Mesner Loeb's Loeb's participation in the first 24 issues of the Max. Keith was eternally grateful and Mage was good experience. Keith finally at least partially had his foot in the door of the professional comic book industry, but by 1987, Sam Keith was again struggling to find work. While Matt Wagner won multiple awards and started to do more with his creator-owned character of Grendel, Keith contributed to a number of low-rent licensed property titles, including The Fish Police, Johnny Quest, Amazing Comics Premieres, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles parody title Radioactive Black Belt Hamsters. According to Sam Keith, the only work he could get was as an inker, and when they offered to let him do pencils, it didn't really matter what it was on and that it was on a book called Radioactive Black Belt Hamsters. Keith instantly became friends with satirist Don Chin and would remain grateful for what he perceived as a favor given how poorly he viewed his own work. The people and associations that Sam Keith would meet and make while working with Don Chin would also be extremely important years down the road in Sam Keith's career. 1987 was a bleak period, though, with Sam Keith contributing small one-page stories, pinups for covers, mostly for books like Critters by Fanagraphics, Airboy by Eclipse, and Blood of Dracula by Apple Press. 
But at the tail end of 1987, Sam Keith landed what he hoped would be his big break, the upcoming Manhunter series from DC. Unfortunately, Manhunter would not jumpstart Sam Keith's career as he hoped for numerous reasons, but would instead set him on a path for a level of exposure and success that would ultimately prove to be his undoing. Sam Keith has always said that Manhunter was not a good fit and that he was still struggling to define his own style at that time and did not get along with his editor on the title, Barbara Randall. He's even gone so far as to say in several interviews he quote unquote wasn't ready yet and that Barbara Randall agreed with him. Interviews with Keith aren't very numerous and finding good information in them is sometimes a rather taxing proposition given Keith's propensity for exaggeration and self-deprecation, neither of which make Keith the most reliable of narrators. You kind of have to read between the lines of what Sam Keith is saying and then put it in the context of what he says about the same thing, say, 10 years down the line. When Sam Keith talks about DC not believing that he was ready, I think in essence what he's saying is he didn't feel like he was ready. While I have no doubt that there was some apprehension on DC's end as to whether Sam Keith was ready to work on Batman or Superman or something, there was definitely people at DC who thought he was more than capable of handling at least something like Manhunter. Monthly titles have simply never been of interest to Sam Keith. Despite his working in a field that concentrates on those types of publications, any attempt at locking him into a monthly title seemed to be destined for failure from an early point in Keith's career. In fact, beginning with the 1988 Manhunter series, it seems like Sam Keith only did monthly series because it was expected of him. That was just kind of what you were supposed to do in comics, according to other people. But Sam Keith hated them with a passion. After only four issues on Manhunter, Sam Keith was sure he was done working for DC. He was so sure that he secured a job producing a number of Nemesis the Warlock covers for Fleetway Publications in 1989. I don't know how much of what he says is actually true, but Keith thought that his art had gone over so disastrously that he was prepared to slip back into the obscure ranks of the fading independent comic book market. Fate, however, had other plans in mind, and in 1989, Sam Keith would make a series of harassing phone calls, <laughs> not really, that would change his life forever. Keith had been pestering Vertigo editor Karen Berger for work, and according to Sam Keith, he just locked into working on Sandman. Sam Keith was actually up for two books, Dr. Fate with J.M. DeMatteis and Sandman with Neil Gaiman. DeMatteis was a known name and Dr. Fate was a known character, but they ended up getting someone with a known name, and Sam Keith was going to be working with Neil Gaiman, a then unknown writer from the UK on Sandman, a reboot of a character no one had heard of. Sam Keith was not thrilled about the idea. In fact, according to Sam Keith, no one was anyone's first choice on Sandman. Both Neil Gaiman and Karen Berger had approached numerous other people about the art, but no one else could meet deadlines or was interested. With so much information out there about it and having so much written about it, you would think that the details of Sam Keith's time on Sandman would be easy to figure out in detail. But Sam Keith appears to have distanced himself from the property so early on that accounts from him are beyond scarce for a subject so heavily covered in every detail and facet. Because of certain statements that Sam Keith has made in the past, I had always believed that Neil Gaiman wanted him off of Sandman almost immediately. It now appears much more likely and plausible that Sam Keith himself wanted to leave Sandman from almost before day one. In an early series of conversations, Sam Keith told Neil Gaiman and Karen Berger that Pete Craig Russell should be penciling the series, not Sam Keith. Gaiman and Berger apparently actually agreed with him, but said that Russell took too long and couldn't meet deadlines like he could. <laughs> This pessimistic outlook on Keith's part and what I perceive as a lack of artistic respect on Karen Berger's part in a lot of cases would set the stage for what would begin as arguments and culminate in Sam Keith's complete disillusionment in Sandman. From the beginning, Karen Berger and Sam Keith butted heads creatively quite often, with Karen Berger legendarily even going so far as to make Sam Keith redraw almost 40 pages of the first issue because she wasn't happy with them. 
for no additional pay. Sam Keith has said in interviews he actually thought about quitting comics when she ordered him to redraw those 40 pages. He hadn't been paid in months, and she expected him to work on them all over again for free. Ultimately, Sam Keith came to feel that Karen Berger not only didn't appreciate his work, but that he should go against his every artistic instinct in an effort to please her, which was killing him inside. The more he tried to do what she asked, the more unhappy he was, and soon Keith was simply miserable working on Sandman. He wasn't being allowed to draw how or what he wanted, he felt little connection to design or creation of Sandman, and most of all, he thought his art was completely out of place for the series. To try and soften the workload and improve the look of his work, Keith had enrolled the help of an old acquaintance to do inks and bear a great deal of the heavy lifting with the finished art. A friend that he thought of as vastly more refined and talented, who he'd met during his time with Don Chin on radioactive black belt hamsters in 1988, actually. A man named Mike Dringenberg. While Dringenberg would go on to provide both pencils and inks for Sandman and co-create Death in Issue 8, one of the most successful DC characters of all time, Sam Keith had called him almost out of desperation. It was Sam Keith's hope that by working with someone as talented as Mike Dringenberg on inks, someone he had a prior working relationship with and knew they would successfully be able to hide the fact that Sam Keith felt he should never have been allowed to do the book from Karen Berger and he would somehow survive his time on Sandman. And those are Sam Keith's words, survive his time on Sandman. From the very beginning, it's obvious that Sam Keith never planned on sticking around and that was long before Sandman started becoming a sort of trial by fire. There doesn't seem like there was anything that anyone could do to keep Sam Keith interested in a subject long enough to want to be on a monthly book. This was just a reoccurring theme in Sam Keith's career. Sandman, though, seemed especially painful and tragic in the long run. When Sam Keith saw the art for the first issue of Sandman, he thought that he should quote unquote throw himself off the top of a building. According to Keith, other professionals in the business told him that he should quit the industry. He hated the work and he was ashamed of it. Despite the fact it reportedly sold more than 80,000 copies when it was released. The truth of the situation is that Sam Keith was unhappy and in his own head, he was out of his league. Karen Berger was not the only one who wasn't pleased with the art. Sam Keith probably hated it way more than she did. Keith began to have heated disputes with longtime friend and colleague Mike Dringenberg, who if you remember Sam Keith had brought on as anchor himself. The two were friends, so I don't think that Sam Keith ever got really nasty with Mike Dringenberg, but Dringenberg could sense there was something wrong. When he asked Sam Keith what it was he was doing wrong, Sam Keith reportedly told him that Dringenberg should have been providing the pencils and Sam Keith providing the inks, not the other way around. As artistic tensions mounted, Drenchenberg did his best to accommodate Keith's disgruntled moods, while Neil Gaiman was constantly being caught in the middle of these artistic disputes between Berger and Keith. And according to Sam Keith, Neil Gaiman invariably sided with Karen Berger. Sam Keith liked Neil Gaiman, and he thought the writer would have his back, but he didn't. Or at least Sam Keith didn't feel like he did. Sam Keith says in interviews to this day that this kind of infighting and one-sided argument is quote unquote just how things work. At the time, Sam Keith came to believe that Neil Gaiman and Karen Berger both wanted him off Sandman. It became an all-encompassing conspiracy of people who didn't like his work for various reasons and wanted him off the series before it even really started in Sam Keith's mind. Years later, when he looked back on things, though, he was able to see how his own self-consciousness, apprehension, and anxiety had engineered a massive conspiracy that maybe wasn't all it was cracked up to be. I think that Karen Berger can be extremely coarse and direct. Some people like Sam Keith do not react well to this kind of confrontation. Other people like Mike Allred are literally propelled into greatness by it. And if you want to learn more about that, check out the little link that should be popping up around here somewhere. Uh, I don't think that Neil Gaiman and Karen Berger were out to get 
Sam Keith off the book, at least not from the start. In fact, Neil Gaiman tried his best to cater to Sam Keith's strengths. He wrote issue four basically all for Sam Keith. According to the comics interview, Sam Man's Super Spectacular, Gaiman said, quote unquote, this one's for you. Despite being able to reach some common ground in the fourth issue, with Neil Gaiman sending Sam Man to hell as a literal excuse for Sam Keith to draw crazy monsters all over the place, Neil Gaiman already had the first 10 to 12 issues planned and outlined when he started Sandman. He was ultimately unwilling to deviate from that outline too much, and Sam Keith has said in the years since that while he appreciated the two trying to find a common ground, he ultimately just felt guilty that Neil Gaiman had to deviate from his outline lines or cater his writing at all. Sam Keith has also admitted that his feelings were hurt by some of the things that were asked of him on the Sandman series. Not only was he disgruntled that Neil Gaiman always took her side in arguments, Sam Keith was especially unhappy when Karen Berger suggested that Dave McKean should provide all of the covers for the book. He wanted to do that. It was his book. And I think it was kind of crushing for Sam Keith when Neil Gaiman told him that he wanted McKean for the covers too. In the end with Karen Berger and Neil Gaiman so unified on most aspects of the book like this, Sam Keith felt like he had little recourse but to acquiesce to their requests. The worse things got, the more Sam Keith began to second guess himself, wondering if his quote unquote artistic instincts were what Berger or Gaiman would want. The more withdrawn and self-suppressing that he became, the happier Berger in particular was with the work. But Sam Keith was absolutely miserable. There's a famous quote that gets kicked around a lot, where Sam Keith supposedly said he'd left Sandman because he felt like Jimi Hendrix in The Beatles. This is not the quote from Sam Keith. That is Neil Gaiman. Sam Keith said, quote, I feel like I'm playing in the wrong band. Neil Gaiman's interpretation of this into Jimi Hendrix in The Beatles is interesting because let's forego the fact that he's directly comparing himself with The Beatles, but he's equating Sam Keith with Jimi Hendrix, a wonderfully apt analogy. It also, I think, goes a long way to reinforcing my belief that Neil Gaiman thought and still thinks of Sam Keith's work very highly. Sam Keith felt like he was out of place. He was unhappy with his work and his relationship with Karen Berger was strained to say the least. This is all true. Neil Gaiman might have even been a little unsure as to how well Sam Keith's art fits Sandman. This is also true. But I don't think that Neil Gaiman necessarily wanted Sam Keith off of the series, especially not from the start. Neil Gaiman famously fought to retain a portion of the Sandman character rights so both Mike Dringenberg and Sam Keith would receive royalties on the title. It would seem like this would put to rest any notion in Sam Keith's head that he hadn't contributed to the series, especially when it comes to Neil Gaiman's opinion on this matter. Keith instead emphatically states in interviews that he doesn't feel like he deserves the credit or royalties from Sandman. Keith insists that the characters were already basically thought up and designed when he came onto the series, with Keith essentially only providing the design for Morpheus's iconic gas mask apparatus. Sam Keith seems like he felt suffocated in pre-existing designs and concepts by Neil Gaiman from the start. Mike McKean had done a series of figure studies which Sam Keith described as a dark drawing of a man with lines through his face. The drawing Sam Keith is actually talking about here is the original concept drawing by Neil Gaiman himself who had come up with the character and subsequently gotten Dave McKean to further refine it from there. Apparently, both of these series of drawings were shown to Sam Keith when he joined the series to exemplify what they wanted Sam Man to look like. Sam Keith actually mistook the figure as quote unquote, that guy from Hellblazer, mistaking them for pictures of John Constantine though. Keith took this idea of a mysterious man in a trench coat and filtered it through the lens of the artist who should have been working on Sam Man in his opinion, P. Craig Russell. The end result, as drawn by Sam Keith, looks absolutely nothing like John Constantine, but the gaunt, nebulous design of Morpheus is completely written off by Sam Keith, who claims he quote-unquote didn't have a thing to do with that character. According to Sam Keith, all he did was draw some quote-unquote embarrassing gas mask sketches, and they picked out the one that they hated the least, which was consequently the only one that he had bothered to ink. Neil Gaiman obviously does not 
hold this opinion. Around the time that issue one came out, Vertigo informed Neil Gaiman that they had decided Sandman was a version of the already existing character that had been rebooted by Jack Kirby in the 1970s and that therefore DC owned the rights to this character. Neil Gaiman countered that they were completely different and according to Sam Keith, basically threatened to leave if they weren't all given a part of the rights to the character. To this day, Sam Keith says that he gets two regular checks, one for Sandman and one for the Max, and that he's happy he actually created at least one of them. I understand what Sam Keith is playing out there, but it's difficult to believe that he's still so unhappy with work he did in 1988, he still cannot appreciate it or take credit for it in 2020. Around this time, Sam Keith's wife asked him why he was staying on the title. She said that there was probably a million other people who could be doing what he was doing and doing it better. He was unhappy and it didn't look like his work, so why stay on the title? Sam Keith agreed and unable to handle Sandman any longer, he departed the title for Greener Pastures in 1989. He then drew the killing pack for the 1989 Secret Origins special, partnered with Alan Grant, who instantly fell in love with Keith's bizarre anatomy and dynamic illustration style. Grant would be an important early champion of Keith's work and quickly suggested that they should do a Lobo book. The two tried furiously to get the ball rolling for time, apparently, but Keith's relationship with DC was quickly souring, so he and Grant began pitching ideas elsewhere. Sam Keith's last work for DC was on the two-part Epicurus the Sage starting in 1989 published under the Piranha Press imprint. Epicurus teamed Keith with a writer from his past, William Mesner Loeb's. For years, Keith and Mesner Loeb's tag team getting one another work over and over. Mesner Loeb's had sold the Epicurus story to DC and when asked if he had an artist in mind, he instantly thought of Sam Keith. Epicurus is extremely fondly remembered by those of us that actually read it. Unfortunately, Epicurus the Sage was well received by comic professionals, but Piranha Press never really got any traction and the series fizzled with poor sales and little attention. Fortunately, Sam Keith's penchant for always working would finally pay off in spades though. He contributed a random pinup of Freddy Krueger to the second issue of Marvel's Freddy Krueger's Nightmare on Elm Street series. The editors on the title were so taken by Sam Keith's illustration, they offered him the title. And he accepted. If we've learned one thing by this point though, it's that when Sam Keith accepts an assignment on a monthly book, chaos is not long to ensue. Keith had spent way too long on that one illustration to get it to look right, and he knew he was never going to be able to pull off a monthly series of that quality. This is according to Sam Keith himself. I have literally no idea why he would accept an assignment on a monthly book like this after he just escaped from his entrapment on Sandman. It just doesn't make sense, but he did. He agreed to do the book against his better judgment and right away he won it out. He says everyone around him was talking about how seedy the title was and how they wanted to leave, including Joe Jusco who was doing covers. When Peter David told him the title was going nowhere, Sam Keith bowed out before even starting work on a single issue of A Nightmare on Elm Street. Instead, Dead, Sam Keith was offered issue 368 of The Incredible Hulk, filling in for later fellow Image alumni Dale Kilm. This is actually one of the most important comics in the world for me. I absolutely rank it as one of the best things I have ever read, and I did an episode of Page Turners about it a long time ago if you feel like checking it out and learning a little bit more about it. I apparently was not the only one who loved it. The Hulk issue went over like gangbusters for Marvel. Some people were a little taken aback by Sam Keith's anatomy, but for the most part, people were really excited to see more Marvel stuff from Sam Keith. Keith, in turn, was eager to work on Marvel's legendary stable of characters. Before he could do anything about the interest at Marvel, though, Sam Keith had to complete the work that he was already contracted for. After Epicurus had failed to garner attention and Keith thought that his working relationship with DC was done, he had inked a deal with Dark Horse Comics to publish the four-part Aliens miniseries Earth War starting in June of 1990, and the second book of Epicurus the Sage, which Piranha Press had already commissioned in February of 1991. 
Earth War was not an extremely pleasant experience for Sam Keith, who had his drawings tampered with by 20th Century Fox, who was unpleased with the fact that Sam Keith drew women with actual hips. They shrank the hips and kept the breasts the same size, which really seemed to irk Sam Keith as much as it does me, who went so far as to basically apologize about it in at least one interview that I read from the time. While it might not be too well remembered today, Earth War was huge with a ton of people who did not even really read comics picking it up because it was an Aliens book and instantly falling in love with Sam Keith's style. Between Aliens Earth War and The Incredible Hulk number 368, Sam Keith was becoming a force to be reckoned with. Keith maintained an absolutely insane work schedule and it was really starting to pay off. People were starting to take note of Sam Keith as something special. In August of 1991, Keith partnered with Fanagraphics, who he'd worked with while doing some illustrations and stories for their title Critters in 1988, to release a collection of unreleased portfolio work, sketches, and reprints of earlier black and white independent work in the two-issue limited series IV4E. The fact that people were even willing to pay for reprints of black and white independent work and stuff from his sketchbooks was a sign that Sam Keith was finally arriving as an artist. The culmination of Sam Keith's hard work and determination would come in 1991 when Marvel Comics Presents editor Terry Cavanaugh called Sam Keith with an offer. Apparently, Todd McFarlane had originally signed on to do the Wolverine Blood Hungry series for Marvel Comics Presents to follow up the absolutely stellar Weapon X storyline by Barry Windsor Smith, but part of the deal had been that McFarlane was going to get to redesign Wolverine's costume and Marvel had backed out at the last minute, McFarlane refused to draw the story otherwise. I know McFarlane is still super famous now, but it's important to remember this is just before the split for Image. He was at the top of his game and replacing him on a title was basically a sure fire way to get a massive amount of exposure. Why Todd McFarlane didn't take the series wasn't really important to Sam Keith at that point. All he knew was that Marvel was going to let him draw Wolverine and they were going to let him draw a lot of him. Sam Keith was paired with his Hulk collaborator, Peter David, for the Wolverine Blood Hungry series. And before the series was even published, Marvel approached Sam Keith about doing promotional artwork for a proposed trade paperback, which at that time was not an everyday occurrence for a series in 1991. This began the hype train with images of Keith's immortal cover for Marvel Comics Presents 85 everywhere you look. If you read any interviews with Sam Keith, even during this period, he makes it sound like everyone was shocked and horrified by what he was doing to Wolverine and these other Marvel characters. He constantly refers to himself as the quote-unquote big feet guy and consistently undermines how instrumental he was in opening the floodgates for a lot of illustrators that have followed and some that were already active to finally garner a modicum of mainstream attention. As a kid that was around when they were released, let me tell you, none of my friends thought his stuff was weird. We loved it. There is no other reason on earth Earth that I know who Cyber is other than Sam Keith illustrated Wolverine biting his eyeball out. Period. End of sentence. Unlike a lot of falsely modest people, I think Sam Keith putting himself down and making fun of himself in interviews is actually how he feels about his stuff. Even in an interview with the official Marvel Rah Rah magazine, Marvel Age, he seems befuddled that the interviewer enjoys his take on Wolverine, insisting throughout the interview that people should be shocked and revolted by what he's doing. While Sam Keith was busy kicking himself, though, Marvel was hard at work pressing him for more and more material. They tried to up his page count several times, but Keith was comfortable with the eight pages he was doing twice a month. So Marvel decided to do something I had never seen before in my life. They hired Sam Keith to produce two covers for Marvel Comics Presents which would become a flip book as a result. Only six issues into his run, Keith was now completing four 
full cover illustrations and 16 pages of internal art for Marvel Comics Presents alone on a monthly basis. This was on top of the other freelance work that he contributed to during this entire period with Keith contributing a few covers for Marvel Tales and a 10 page Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles parody with the Killing Peck writer Alan Grant for Judge Dredd Magazine number 20. Sam Keith had also apparently begged Peter David to let him draw the green version of the Hulk while they were working on issue 368. So when David began working on Hulk Future Imperfect, Keith came straight to mind. Although obviously George Perez would end up with the gig, that tells you the level that Sam Keith was on at this point. George Perez came in after he couldn't do the book. With his workload full and the phone still ringing off the hook, you would think that Sam Keith might have gotten a big head or at least gotten it into his thick skull that there was plenty of people that liked his stuff a lot. Instead, Sam Keith was apparently so convinced the only reason anyone at Marvel put up with his crazy stuff was his editor and friend, Terry Cavanaugh, who had hired him. When it was rumored that Cavanaugh might lose his job or leave Marvel, Sam Keith was so sure his days at Marvel Comics were numbered that he approached and signed a deal with DC Comics for a series of Batman title covers. This time though, Sam Keith might have overextended himself a little bit too much. Marvel did not fire him and Detective Comics subsequently went twice monthly. This meant Sam Keith was now doing six full cover illustrations, 16 pages of internal artwork, and various freelance work like illustrations for card sets, pinups, and more covers. The man was insane. And after Detective Comics went twice monthly, I think he felt a little bit insane too. Keith told Marvel that he needed to take a break from doing internal work for a little bit and has said in the interviews that he did some of the worst work of his entire career on those Batman covers. Keith in fact had no idea how he's going to get the Batman covers done. There just was not enough time in the day so he did what he always did. He called up a friend, this time Kelly Jones, who had helped Keith with his breakout issue of The Incredible Hulk who thankfully agreed to help Keith out with the back covers. They had sat for two days and banged out the immensely successful Hulk 368 with ease, but unfortunately the Batman covers would not fare so well. Some of them are great, but there's others where you can just tell Sam Keith was exhausted. By this point in 92, he was doing at least six, if not more completed covers that would hit the stands every single month. His stuff was on cards, posters, shirts, and prints. It was mind-boggling. Keith even did covers for some parody books being released by Don Shin, who had given him penciling work when no one else would. Keith felt obligated to contribute covers for The Pummeler and several of Chris's other parody books, including, funnily enough, Spittin' Image, released in October of 1992, where he did a parody cover of the first wave of Image characters. Keith's own Image property, The Max, would launch only a few short months later in March of 1993, but how and why did Sam Keith make the jump from Marvel and DC to Image to work on a monthly title? Ironically, while Sam Keith would seemingly do anything to avoid doing a full monthly book, this desire to do shorter eight page stories would actually end up being the reason that he eventually took on a monthly title at Image Comics. Overworked and underpaid like most freelance artists, Sam Keith ended up talking with Jim Lee about what they were doing with Image Comics. According to some accounts, Sam Keith called him up just to see what Image was all about. And at other points, according to Keith, Jim Lee kind of took him aside as Image was still germinating and told him, hey, you know, if you want to get involved. If you read the Inside Comics interview with Sam Keith, it thankfully occurred while Darker Image was still going to be an actual thing. An image had happened, but wasn't the phenomena that it would become. Sam Keith, for his own personal reasons, just doesn't seem to find a single shred of joy in talking about, reliving, rehashing, or even remembering this period from the comic boom of the 1990s. I suppose he has his own perfectly valid reasons for this, which we'll discuss later, but his accounts and recollections of this period are shoddy at best. Thankfully, there's some great information if you read between the lines of the Inside Comics interview. There were rumors about Image before it ever happened, circulating especially amongst the hired hands at Marvel. 
The word on the rumor mill was that Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, Rob Liefeld, Mark Silvestri, and some other guys were all going to just up and quit working for Marvel and DC and strike out on their own. Sam Keith was definitely curious. And while I would never label Sam Keith as an adventurous man, he does, however, possess an intellect that is belied by his self-deprecating personality and unassuming demeanor. If luck had anything to do with getting Sam Keith in the position he was in, as he so often claims, then his seemingly inexhaustible work ethic and keen wits kept him afloat in the turbulent changing tides and times of the comic book industry during the 1990s. According to the Inside Comics interview, it seems like Jim Lee and Sam Keith had a few conversations, probably at different points, while Image was still starting and then finally taking shape. The more they talked, the more interested Sam Keith became in the entire idea. You have to understand, this was unheard of. No one left their posts at the Big Two to do independent books. They were the big boys on the block with the best toys that everyone wanted to play with. This was the world that Sam Keith came from. He was heavily invested in this idea of quote unquote building his career on the backs of other people's characters. In particular, he longed to work on the regular Wolverine series. During the course of these conversations with Jim Lee, Sam Keith came to realize something extremely important though. He was, as he puts it, waiting for someone to fall over dead at Marvel on Wolverine, Hulk, or Doctor Strange. But he began to realize he was never going to be put on one of those top tier books. While he achieved so much stature and admiration from fans, he was still the weird guy who drew big feet at Marvel and they were never going to expose the world to his vile anatomical nightmares. As the idea of Image came to pass and Darker Image was offered to Sam Keith, at one point Jim Lee told Sam Keith he had to come up with his own character for the series. When asked why he hadn't done this before, Sam Keith answered that it was basically because he didn't want to. For him, drawing comics was enough. He didn't have a grand plan to launch his own series with his own character or anything, like most of the people who go into the business do. He was content to draw and illustrate comics featuring other people's characters. But there was a multitude of disparaging people telling him that he shouldn't be. People who were beginning to lash out with ever greater aggression at the comic book industry because they felt suffocated, ignored, and alienated by the very medium they loved so much. Sam Keith, while almost certainly feeling as equally oppressed, was simply smart enough to know what he had gotten himself into. He'd spent 10 years working his way up from the independent circuit, jumping his way through all of the hoops. He knew what he was signing up for. Even after everything that he'd been through, Sam Keith wanted to draw comics more than anything in the world. But he didn't have sketchbook after sketchbook filled with a magical Spider-Man sporting chains and a BDSM outfit, or even a green-skinned cop with a fin for hair that he'd come up with in high school. Especially by this point, it seemed like all the originality was getting beaten out of Sam Keith, like some poor kid getting reprogrammed at a boarding school through a series of barely legal torture methods. He'd been slowly drained of his will to think or act in any way that he wasn't told to. There was no room for an original character in the mindscape of Sam Keith that editors and writers kept raising to the ground. This wasn't to say I think that Neil Gaiman or Karen Berger or anyone was directly at fault here in particular. Sam Keith is an illustrator of the highest magnitude and order, but he's never seemed like he was driven by some burning desire to tell his Batman story or his Spider-Man story. Sam Keith just draws. He's always drawn. That's just how Sam Keith do. He draws what he likes and what he likes happens to be big hairy hunchbacks with a million noodly details who look like poster children from some orthodontic nightmare who must have way too many muscles and feature anatomically impossible features that would make Salvador Dali blush, or at least he did before the max, but let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Sam Keith made the move to Image with the understanding he would be working on the newly announced Darker Image title. Darker Image was basically going to be exactly like Marvel Comics Presents, containing three stories in each issue. But unlike Marvel Comics Presents, Darker Image was going to feature the big guns. The other artists announced for Darker Image, Jim Lee himself, fresh off of setting a world record 
record for the best-selling modern age comic book of all time at 8.2 million copies with X-Men number one, was introducing a new character, Deathblow, and Rob Liefeld, fresh off of the success of Cable and Deadpool and having only been deposed of his own record-breaking sales by Jim Lee, was creating a new character, Blood Wolf, for the series as well. Darker Image was going to be a juggernaut with Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld attached to the series. But them allowing Sam Keith to contribute the comfortable amount of eight pages a month for four issues, how could he say no? Then they told Sam Keith he could pencil the cover to Darker Image, and both Lee and Liefeld offered to contribute inks for their respective characters who were to be featured along with Sam Keith's creation, The Max. It was like an actual recipe for making Sam Keith rich and famous. Keith's fateful agreement to do Darker Image would lead to the choice that people would either argue made Sam Keith or completely broke him. At this point, though, I'm much more inclined to say it was both. Join me next week as we talk about why we only ever saw one issue of Darker Image and how the Max 1 actually managed to beat it to shelves in part 2 of how the Max broke Sam Keith, which I'm either going to be calling Keith's own image or Maximum Image. I haven't quite decided. I think I like Maximum Image a lot more. What do you guys think? Get in the comments section. Let me know. I always appreciate your input about this kind of stuff. <laughs> Thanks so much for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed, maybe even learned something. As always, a list of my sources, as well as links to any digitally available sources, as well as further reading, can be found in the description link below. If you did enjoy this video, please hit that like button, share this video with your friends, and if you really enjoyed what you saw, make sure you Hulk smash that subscribe button.